that still on? I don't seem louder to myself. Richard, no? On mute. How's that? Yep. All right. OK. Um, I am here to talk about uh, the double I IF, the I3F, triple IF, IFI. Um, it is still a floating uh, acronym, uh, in terms of, at least in terms of enunciation. Um, I'd like to point out that while I'm up in front, now I'm getting echoes in my head more than normal. Um, Simeon Warner and Rob Sanderson up here in the front are uh, the full participants in the effort and actually uh, two of the three co-editors for the draft image API that I'm going to talk about. So um, though they are multitasking uh, and working because they've heard all of this and it's kind of them to come, they might find themselves on the spot to answer particular questions. Uh, and actually, I am cognizant that I am between you and lunch, and blood sugars and circadian rhythms are all out of whack. So I actually have some questions for you. Um, so I think I'm going to go through this um, relatively quickly. It's an image-based presentation, so uh, they don't necessarily need lots of discussion. But I think that the, this is a topic where uh, it would be interesting to get the open repository community's input and ideas about where this may go next what are specific use cases, and what are specific pieces of software that might be relevant in, in the context of this initiative's objectives. Uh, so there's, there's sort of a, um, uh, an, an irony in the fact that digital images are one of the primary information carriers for lots and lots of context um, that's on the, the internet. So it's uh, books, manuscripts, newspapers, it's visual resources, there are archival materials, maps, um, uh, scrolls, architecture, there's even medical data and uh, the various types of science, technology, and engineering uh, products that are all visually um, conveyed. Um, and yet, ironically, really excellent image delivery is difficult. Um, it's, it's technically challenging. It's challenging to do it well. Um, it tends to be slow. It tends to be expensive to develop and deploy, either in terms of licensing or in terms of time. Um, when it is deployed, it's disjointed across our community and across our environment, and often it's ugly. And you could say, well, in fact, that's not true, and things are as good as they've ever been. But if you look at some of the bright spots, if you look at something like uh, Sea Dragon in terms of performance, or the Google Art Project in terms of kind of the slippiness and the interactivity, or you look at a few pockets of the internet where people have laced in annotation or transcription tools to overlay their materials, it's amazing what the bright spots are doing and what the rest of us are doing. And it's kind of like five years ago when everyone developed their own page turner. And why were there so many page turners is, well, they were all mediocre and it was easy enough to do. And where are we five years later? Well, there are fewer of them because there's been some convergence. But in general, they're still easy enough to do and they're still almost all mediocre. Um, can we do better than this as a community? Um, and the problem is, uh, because it's kind of a, a disjointed and uh, uh, ineffective environment right now, is the repositories suffer. Uh, software developers who have got innovative tools suffer uh, because they don't have a large enough market to necessarily to deploy their tools against. Uh, the users certainly suffer in terms of user experience and trying to navigate across different islands of content. And funders suffer because a lot of times they want to pay for the development of a resource. And what they're basically doing is they have to pay for the redevelopment of yet another mediocre wheel. Uh, and so, so real use cases, uh, consider your, there's a paleographer who would like to compare scribal hands for manuscripts that are held in two different repositories. So digitized manuscripts, and what's uh, this author had particular marks, uh, and that author had particular marks, and I'd like to do a, a cross annotation. So, uh, typically, the way medievalists do this now is they uh, make a side deal with a repository and say, could I have a high resolution image of the pages that I'm interested in? Not, it's kind of like Simeon uh, and the resource sync. It's, it's not an efficient method of trying to transfer large amounts of content or expose large amounts of content. Um, art and architecture instructor who would like to develop a teaching collection. Uh, again, most people are grabbing lower resolution images off the internet and creating local file stores. What happens when the images are upgraded? What happens when new tools are actually developed in the host sites? Those are not accessible. 
uh, humanities scholars who would like to annotate a, uh, a historical map to say this was, uh, this was Napoleon's march into Russia and this is what it looks like on various maps. Um, there are lots of great cartographic tools that support annotation, um, but they are not necessarily deployed against all the places historical maps live. And if you've got a map in one place and a s annotation environment or server in another place, and you can't feed the image through that annotation environment, you're out of luck. Um, from a lot of this room's perspective, uh, you've got a lot of rich content. You uh, started digitizing newspaper. You would like to develop and deploy a, a newspaper viewer that supports deep zoom into your site. Um, that's not a trivial, that's, that's a non-trivial exercise at this point. It's going to require a substantial amount of development. Um, how, is, how effectively could we, how could we make this more efficient as a community? And from a funder, whether they're paying to digitize something or expose a new set of digital resources, could we start mixing and matching or could they see mixing and matching of existing components? So really the content development and the content delivery can really be separated out into separate concerns. Okay, our people are absorbed. Okay, this is good. So I've, I'm making a case that, that the world is not perfect. Um, uh, so we started uh, last September a year-long initiative to look at trying to improve this environment. And as I said earlier, it's six of the world's leading research libraries and Stanford have gathered together to see if we can make something uh, more sensible and more rational out of this environment. Um, and just among the, the starting in seven institutions, this is, we did a, a comparison at the first workshop that we had last September um, uh, with, with the seven participants. And we looked at the range of different image interfaces that we had across all of our seven sites. And there were something like, well, not counting Oxford, um, there were probably something like 15 or 20 interfaces. If you count Oxford, it was probably something more like 40 or 50. Um, Neil Jeffries has a fantastic portal where it's kind of, it, the Bodleian seems, and uh, Wolfram, you might be here, or Anusha, you might be here. There we go. Uh, there we go. So you can, Apple opportunity to correct or confirm what I'm saying. Um, it's sort of like the halfway house for discarded, or not discarded, but legacy, proud legacy digital humanities collection websites where grant funding runs out and researchers at Oxford say, what should we do with this? And the answer is give it to the Bodleian. And they've got all sorts of vintage collections that go from the mid-90s up, up to this decade, um, all using different stacks, uh, all using different data models. And it's, it's quite amazing. So uh, just across that, you can see the, the range. And I think most of the institutions that were there would say, hey, we're doing, yes, we can deliver our images. But in general, we don't think that these are necessarily best of breed tools or delivery environments. And for those of us who are deploying more than one environment, that might not be a bad thing, but we'd certainly like all the images available through a best environment, uh, a best common environment, even if there are specialist tools. Um, and so if, you take a, if we take a step back and we look at, let's look at a particular microcosm of content, um, which is digitized medieval manuscripts. This is something that Stanford's been involved in for about the last five years. We've been, or s maybe six or seven at this point, uh, with uh, Parker on the web application. So this is uh, about 560 digitized um, Anglo-Saxon manuscripts that are held at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge. Cambridge digitized them, um, Stanford put them online. And so we did, this, uh, we did this development of this really nice, arguably best in class uh, manu digital manuscript deli delivery site. Um, and we're not the only ones to have done that. Um, the Ramon de la Rose application at Johns Hopkins University has got something that's got several hundred uh, uh, French manuscripts. Uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale has got uh, more than several hundred French manuscripts uh, delivering out through Gallica, which is their uh, front end uh, search engine and deli content delivery application. Uh, the St. Gall Library Ecodices uh, project in Switzerland is trying to deliver all Swiss manuscripts through an interface. And so we've got just four examples of um, siloed application delivery, all uh, not coincidentally funded with Mellon money, um, in order to try to get these digital resources out. And several of the scholars involved in these projects and the Mellon Foundation started asking, how come we keep getting lots of different interfaces for this content? And in fact, I'd like to compare a Parker manuscript with a Rose manuscript. How do I do that? And we didn't have a good answer. Um, 
And the problem that we have now is every repository is essentially a silo. It's its own content, it's, it's got its own data models, it's got its own application interfaces, and we did certain things in Parker that they didn't do in Rose, and vice versa, and there's certain affordances <coughs> based on kind of the opinions and the needs of the sponsoring scholars and the technology groups that deployed them, but there is no way to bring Rose content into the Parker environment and vice versa. So every repository is a silo, every application is also a one-off. That means each of us are totally fronting the development cost and the maintenance costs of, of inventing our own wheel. And ours is maybe slightly rounder with shinier spokes than someone else's, uh, but others have got big tires that go off-road, um, but they're all essentially doing the same thing. And then finally, from the user's perspective, just the variety of interfaces that was displayed in that first opening scene of screens is the buttons are in all different places. And navigating and trying to use the tools that are in one or another um, application is actually non-trivial. So our argument is that we've actually confused the, uh, the roles and the responsibilities of the different stakeholders in this environment. And there's three big uh, entities here. There are the scholars. Um, and what they really want to do is be able to find, use, analyze, and annotate uh, the resources that are on the web. And they want to be able to mix and match the tools. They don't necessarily want to have to develop the tools themselves. But in this case, a lot of humanities scholars in particular are actually doing that tool development as well. We also have tool developers who want to actually have apply their tools against resources and have a user community. And the current siloization makes that very difficult. It's very difficult to get develop a tool and have it applied against more than one content base and be used by more than one population of users. And from a repository perspective, we'd really like to see the separation of content from its delivery. And if we can host the content, we know the applications are going to change over time. Can't we come up with a little bit stronger of an API so that we can structure our content and serve our content, but we can introduce best of breed applications and introduce new best of breed or specialized applications over time as they develop? So for the Parker application, when we started, um, two actual use cases that we had um, uh, people who would like to use the TPIN transcription tool, it does automated image analysis, draws bounding boxes across lines of script on a manuscript text, and then, and then writes a transcription box below it. So it vastly speeds up the process of doing transcription. Uh, there were all sorts of scholars who would like to use that. So what we did is we sent TPIN a hard drive full of TIFFs. Awesome, right? This is resource sync would have been cool. Um, Dictionary of Old English, their job is to go through and basically cite the first use of English words, and then they want to basically provide keyword and context. So the first time this word was used was in this Anglo-Saxon or uh, manuscript, and there, there's a number of instances of those within the Parker collection. So we did not send them TIFFs because they didn't have the infrastructure to do it, but what we did is we gave them secret backdoor access via URL. Uh, and this is where we learned, or relearned, the issue of persistence. Um, we never told them that they would persist, but we should have thought about that, because uh, later when we changed the URL structure, they were upset, and we had to work with them to fix it. So what's a better system? Actually codify APIs, right? This is, this is not new. So not only could we serve the Parker application content out of uh, the, red, the red square cube is images, metadata, and annotations, we could feed our application, but we could feed images and metadata to, to other applications. And then for something like TPIN, if they're producing transcriptions, maybe we would actually do a round trip and bring those annotations back into the data store. Um, and then if you go beyond a single uh, silo, and you say not only is Parker doing that, but if Oxford and Rose and the BNF all do that, well, we begin to see an ecosystem. So we can serve Parker, and the BNF can serve Gallica as they do. But then you can have people, scholars, who have their own customized annotation and transcription environments for doing whatever specialist work they would like to do. Or you can start to do cross-repository search and discovery environments. So you could actually bring resources together. I want not just Anglo-Saxon manuscripts from Parker or from, from Cambridge. I want them Anglo-Saxon manuscripts from all over the world or any participating repository. So people could go out, they could use Oyster or use a, a different mechanism, uh, collate all of those things together, and then they could actually present them in context. You wouldn't have to go back out to the source repositories to actually view the content. You could bring that into a homogenous viewing environment. Uh, so about uh, two years ago, Stanford started a uh, cooperative project called DMS Variably, uh, DMS Technology, uh, 
DMS interoperability, um, or just DMS, there's a hole on one side. And we brought together uh, technologists, not scholars, from about a dozen different institutions, many of the ones on the previous boxes to say, can we actually talk to each other and can we, we know basically what the scholars would like. Can we talk to each other and figure out a smart way to do this so we can do it collaboratively and when they ask us for a page turner, we can say, yes, we'll actually use the page turner that Oxford developed or we'll use the image delivery software that the British Library or the BNF have developed. Um, and uh, further to that, we said, hey, are there actually tools that we can see develop that we can snap on to our individual repositories, so annotation tools or transcription tools, so they're working against common image bases. Um, and so over the course of about uh, two years, a group has met six or seven times with tool developers, repositories, and then some validations by individual research projects. And we came up with what we think are the basic building blocks for supporting this interoperable environment. So it's basically that that ecosystem with the connected arrows on the previous slide. So that includes the ability to uh, deliver images uh, via a common API that all of the supporting or participating repositories would, would observe and support. It also included a data model for medieval manuscripts. One of the primary modalities that we're anticipating is that people actually want to bring a paged, uh, a paged object into their local environment and sequence through the pages. Well, what is the sequence of the pages? Um, and with medieval manuscripts, actually, that's a complex question. Um, they can off, they are disbound, they can be rebound, they can be split across multiple repositories. And how do you address that as well as issues such as uh, fly leafs and fold outs and inserts? So and uh, anyone who's been involved in a digitization pro project for these types of materials know that this, it's the exceptions that represents, the 10% of exceptions represents about 80% of the work. Um, it would be great if everything was open and free, uh, except it's not. So we have to figure out how do we actually support differential levels of permissions and authentication and, and authorization within this. So some of the, some of the resources that are involved in um, this interoperable environment are actually licensed. So there's a freemium model where everyone can see a certain level of material and then beyond that only subscribers can see it. Um, and because everyone is trying to figure out how to sustain these operations, this is an important, this is an important element and it's part of the world that, that we're living in right now. Uh, we also notice that across the multiple institutions, everyone is trying to do the sea dragon-like deep zoom. Um, and within the, uh, the, the institutions that were listed above, there was a real convergence on JATOKA or J2K as kind of the open source and preferred tool to do it. Also talking to all the institutions, everyone realized uh, J2K, when you first install it, and if you don't know what you're doing, runs like a pig. Um, and so uh, a bunch of people had spent a fair amount of duplicative effort trying to do performance optimization for Jatoka, but no one had been talking to each other. And so we realized if we could do a reference implementation of Jatoka and actually share some of the optimizations, we'd be leaving the world a better place. Uh, an interactive open source page training application, so people didn't have to invent their own. And then finally, some open annotation collaboration compatible tools for doing things like transcription and annotation, which are arguably kind of the two primitive functions that any medievalist or uh, manuscript scholar really needs to be able to perform. So uh, the DMS uh, project, the first phase is just wrapping up. Um, it's, we're anticipating another round of funding for some follow on work. Uh, starting in October, but some of the, the product and the output is available. So this is an example of a, um, a combined index which actually has, is there a laser on this? Maybe. Oh, cool. Uh, a combined index which is pulling from um, Oxford, the BNF, Stanford, uh, the, the British Library, and you can get thumbnail views. These are actually being pulled from the from the remote repositories using the image API, and then there are dig deep links back into the API using the shared Canvas data model. So you can actually go not just to the top level uh, resource, but you can deep link into it because there's a common understanding of what is the structure of the manuscript. And then within, if you go to an individual resource, um, if you go to an individual resource, there are links out to the annotation tool, which is DM for Digital Map of Monday or uh, the transcription tool from TPEN, and when a user clicks on that and they've already got an account, 
uh, basically those remote tools are doing a dynamic pool of the image and the necessary metadata into their environments using this interoperable environment. So TPIN's not pulling from the, the, hard drive of resor uh, the hard drive of tips that we gave them a while back. So this makes perfect sense right in the world of manuscripts. It's a, it's a finite world. Uh, there are a lot of people who, and a lot of institutions who already know each other. It's a community of scholars that's got a certain level of bounds, though it's, it's surprisingly large to a non-medievalist. Um, and if we could just collaboratively get our act together here, we can actually further manuscript studies. Um, so at the third DMS meeting, um, Sean Martin from the British Library and Neil Jeffries from Oxford and I went to a Cuban restaurant in Palo Alto, because they don't get Cuban food here, I notice. Um, and we started saying, well, if this makes sense for manuscripts, doesn't it make sense for other image-based resources? There are the, everything on that first slide, that's all image-based resources, and it's a, it's a much bigger world, but couldn't we do the same thing? And so we started drawing on the Cuban restaurant's um, paper tablecloth and then ripped this out and brought it with us. Um, and so basically, I double I F or if E or triple I F is can we take some of the precepts and the tools and the APIs that we've started in the DMS environment and can we bring them to uh, the wild, wild, wider world of images? Um, and so we think the answer is yes. So that's when the seven institutions got together. We've spent about the last eight or nine months doing specification of a handful of primary elements. So um, the fundamental one, and many of you may have seen this, is an image delivery API. So this is specification of a RESTful interface to be able to retrieve an image from a remote server uh, using certain parameters and present that through your local environment. Um, and so this is where uh, Simeon and Rob and uh, Stuart Snydman from Stanford were locked into a room for two days in The Hague, uh, though actually it turns out I think they were avoiding the metadata discussion. Um, Actually, I know Simeon was avoiding the metadata discussion, uh, so maybe we were locked in the other room and they were having the good time. Um, if you go to library.stanford.edu slash IIIF slash image API, you will find the full draft specification currently labeled 0.2. We circulated an, a request for comments, and basically it allows you for any uh, given uh, resource from a source repository with a prefix to pull an image um, either in toto or a fragment of it um, to scale that image, in this case size it, to rotate it and then to get color uh, or a, a quality level and then to get a specific MIME type or a specific file format. Wrong device. And blown up for those of you who are following it, there's a certain order of operations that's augmented. But I, I think this is a helpful slide because it gives you a sense of if I can get an image or part of an image from any image server in the world or any image server that was subscribing on this, what kinds of functionalities could I bring with images that I don't hold into my local environment? Uh, a note on that, we are meeting at the end of this week, the working group, and we're going to, uh, we've received a number of comments from the RFC, and uh, there's been an analysis done on that. We're probably going to do a final acceptance on that and then promulgate um, the standard as 0.9 for now until there's enough implementations to either confirm that it's 1.0 or to make a few additional changes. So if you have not seen this and would like to comment on it or review it and want a chance to get the information or get any kind of input into the 0.9 proclamation, uh, you have until Saturday at 4 p.m. Edinburgh time. Um, the second thing that we realized is to actually be able to consume images and display them in remote environments is you need some level of metadata. And this is not, let's come up with a brand new metadata scheme. It is what kind of metadata is critical in order to to drive image presentation in remote viewing environments. So it's really an absolute uh, kind of minimal set, we think, that focuses on things like labels and title and sequence and attribution. Um, this is one of the, this is the main topic for this weekend. Uh, so if you check this space again later, you'll find more information. Um, I can say that it is based on shared canvas. Um, shared canvas, if you're not familiar with that and you haven't had the pleasure of sitting through one of Rob's presentations, it is the love child of uh, digital manuscript uh, interoperability, where Rob has been one of the primary contributors, and open annotation collaboration, where Rob has also been one of the primary uh, contributors. And two projects met in his mind and produced 
this data model. So it's a way of describing uh, the relationship of various parts of image-based artifacts and being able to then uh, attach other things to them like descriptions or annotations. Uh, uh, following the precepts of linked data to allow for uh, open annotation uh, enabled and aware tools. From a software perspective, um, we are not doing software development, but we're hoping to foment lots and lots of software development. Because again, most of us are coming at this from a repository perspective. We'd like to let other people write the software that would let the content in our repositories uh, really shine and be useful to a huge audience. So we have been thinking about this in terms of tiers, uh, in terms of the actually image servers, the ability to serve up images. Uh, uh, right now, uh, there's a lot of interest in Jatoka or a replacement to Jatoka uh, that actually has broad community support that, and that's fast. Um, delivered up through the IIIF image API with authentication and authorization support on top. But then that's being delivered through a set of tools that support uh, deep zooming and panning and rotating. So anything that you're familiar with, with Google Maps or with, with Sea Dragon. And then embedding kind of those portals into um, domain specific or, uh, things like page turners or, uh, or gallery views or cover flows. And so we have a wish list of software that we would like to see developed or that we're intending to work with a variety of people to, to see developed either open source or commercial. Um, and so the a performant community supported image server, um, a super slippy, which is not a technical term, but people seem to understand it, uh, a version of the zoom pan rotate clients. And we're looking at a set of next generation page turners and gallery viewers, and scroll viewers, items like that. And then finally, we'd like to see these actually be compatible with some of the, the things like the, the annotation tools that we've seen deployed on a couple of the more advanced sites or, or geospatial tools. Uh, as I said, it's, been a, it's a one year effort. Um, we're just coming to the end of that one year. This is one of the dissemination events that we have planned. We'll also probably do, be doing a day long workshop at DLF in Denver in November, uh, if any of you would be planning to come, where we'll cover not only this, but probably also try to do some of the software development and then walk through J2K or JPEG 2000 encoding. Um, and at this point, what we're really hoping to see is a lot of people deploy em embrace the APIs and deploy them, um, develop software tools that work against them, and see who else is interested in actually exposing their tools through this interface. Our belief is that if we can spec the APIs and we can expose enough resources just among the seven institutions that were at the first meeting, we counted something like over 10 million individual uh, bibliographic entities, image-based entities. So that's not pages of Google Books with 300 images. That's, that's uh, individual manuscripts or pieces of art or uh, fill in the blank. If you, it's hundreds of millions or billions if you add in the page turn items. Um, but that leads to a broader question uh, which I haven't left a lot of time for, but what's the collective image base of the open repositories community? Could we actually enable Desprints, ePrints, and Fedora to support the IIIF APIs natively, and what would that do for us as a community? Uh, what applications have some of us deployed in terms of access that could benefit from these types of modalities? What would you actually want to show, and what would you, could you bring together for, for documents of the north, uh, um, for these image-based materials, for example? Do you have specific use cases that we should be considering? One of the things that surprised us, because we'd been coming at this out of the, the manuscript space, or many of us, as soon as we published the image API, we got a number of use cases from science, technology, and medicine saying this would be great for looking at images of cell trays. Um, can, have you thought about that? And the answer is no, we hadn't thought about that, but we know there's additional use cases. And then finally, what should IIIF do next? If you think that this makes sense and you think that there is some forward progress uh, and path to be made here, we're just coming to the end of the first year initiative. Um, if you think there's a, a way to do involvement, if there's a funder that might be there, if there's a dissemination event that you have in mind, please come talk to me or Simeon or Rob. And that's it. Uh, the last thing is some key links on IIIF, DMS, and shared canvas. We have time for maybe one or two questions or answers to Tom's questions. Oh, I like that. That's good. <laughs> You're mean. <laughs> I 
Anyone who asks a question can have a Hydra t-shirt. Are any of these uh, tools you mentioned available for reuse now, or is that kind of the intent, like annotation tools, things like that? The um, T-Pen and DM are both probably available. Um, I think they are both open source E, but I'm not sure if their code has actually been distributed yet. Uh, but I know that uh, they are. Pro they would love to have uh, further use and po potentially collaborators. And if you go to the DM site, uh, I think Holly Rob's got a, a co question or a comment on that. If you go to the DMS site, you will find links to both of the tools. So Rob said that the shared canvas code is available, but not easy to install. Improvements welcome. Yes, so the question is, what about Jatoka and the improved non-buggy fast version? Um, our conclusion is that th there is a need for this. Um, there is a space for this. There is even just starting with baby steps of sharing what people have done to patch it or uh, enhance it would be valuable. Um, I think what we're seeing is that there is a need for that. No one has stepped up to the plate yet. Um, and it would be interesting to figure out what would actually make that work on a broader basis. Uh, we expect that probably as part of IIIF, we'll at least have a knowledge base that's published. Um, the National Library of Norway rewrote uh, some of the JPEG encoding, um, uh, the JPEG encoding logic in C, which improved it up, improved its performance by about threefold. And they've said that they'd be willing to make that available to others who would like it. For example, I'm I'm sorry. I there they said that that would be open source. I think it's uh, probably like TPEN and DM. It's not. It's it's. Theoretically open source, but you just can't get to the code. It is not based on Jatoka. You will notice many similarities. And is, is not con the idea was that it was not constrained or limited to Jatoka, and you could actually have other image servers that would support uh, most of the functions or all of the functions within the API. I do have a sort of a I'm sorry. It's just an API. Okay. And the, the, the level zero compliance version for conformance versions is essentially just a task queue with a whole bunch of little things that it just throws. And we, we explicitly went that way to make it easy for, for caching and, and I guess serialization of the object. Okay. And any more questions or discussion can happen over lunch. Let's thank all of our speakers.